Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining our webinar. My name is Adam, Content Marketing Specialist with Henry Schein, and I'll be your moderator. Tonight's webinar focuses on cementation and bonding. Before I turn it over to Dr. Bunnick, I have a few reminders. If you have questions during the presentation, please type them into the questions section and we will answer them as we can. This webinar is being recorded and you will receive the recording next week via email. And lastly, this webinar is sponsored by 3M and no CE credits are being offered for viewing or attending tonight's presentation. Tonight, we're joined by Dr. Sabia Bunnick. Dr. Bunnick is a practicing dentist and CEO of Dental Advisor. Thank you, Dr. Bunnick, for being with us tonight. Over to you. Thank you, Adam, for the wonderful introduction. And thank you, Henry Schein, for hosting me tonight. My name is Dr. Sabia Bunnick. I'm the CEO and editor for The Dental Advisor, and I'm also a practicing clinician. And today I'm going to be talking to you about cementation and bonding, uh, really trying to bridge the gap between research and what we see in practice every day. A couple of disclosures. Uh, I am part owner, a partner at Dental Advisor, and it's really important. I'm going to be talking about a lot of products and a lot of companies today for you guys to know that I'm actually not getting paid by any of the manufacturers. Uh, everything I report on will be strictly from the research that we've done on our own biomaterials laboratory on site, as well as the feedback that we get from our clinicians from our, around the U.S. that are our, our consultants. I am getting an honoraria from Henry Schein today. So normally, any fall, this would be a great slide to show, given that I love football. And uh, But post-COVID, it's a little bit different around here and during the fall season. But my office is, I'm, I practice by myself. It's called Bunnick Dental Studio. And it's across the street from the Michigan Stadium. I've got a really nice small team. And it's just a lot of fun. And any given Saturday, we'll have over 100,000 people uh, flocking the streets to go to one of those games. So we're looking forward to getting back to that soon. And also in Ann Arbor is the Dental Advisor. And the Dental Advisor is an independent evaluation uh, company. And they've been around for 37 years. And we've got 300 clinical consultants in the US. And basically they look at products for us, they don't get paid, and they give us their feedback. And the picture on the right is our editorial board. And we're all pretty local or at least within an, hours, an hour away. And we meet every Wednesday at 7 a.m. And what we do is, you know, if there's a company that sends in a product such as, you know, maybe Tokiyama sent us a bonding agent. So they would send us this bonding agent and we'd put out um, a feeler to our consultants to see who wants to look at this, you know, maybe universal bonding agent. And then, you know, maybe 30 or 40 of those clinicians try out the product for two to three months. And then they give us their feedback based on a, a survey that we actually design, not the manufacturer. So they'll look at that and then they come up with a rating and we base everything on a five plus uh, rating. So you'll see that probably a lot, you'll see it in journals and you'll see it on actual product uh, boxes. You'll see the five uh, plus rating and sometimes it's a four, um, but you'll see our logo in a lot of different places. So the editorial board basically puts takes all that information from the clinical consultants about the product. And then we kind of give it its final rating and we add comments and, our editorial board has clinicians, researchers, dental hygienists, assistants, uh, orthodontists, periodontists. So it's a good mix of people and uh, we all love what we do. We also have a publication that goes out six times a year. And basically it's like a one-on-one on a different topic. So, you know, the one that you see on the far right is simplifying cementation and bonding. You know, we'll kind of break down what's the newest and latest and greatest, how to categorize thing, and then we'll also have our evaluations uh, in the on the back of that uh, issue. More recently this year, since things have been so different, we had to kind of change our editorial process and come up with some new um, main topics, which I encourage you to go check out at the website at dentaladvisor.com. And we're talking about, you know, different face masks, uh, different pandemic products that are essential. Uh, one of the recent issues is on aerosols. We've got some great testing um, that we've done on some of the adjunct uh, products that you can use inside the mouse, such as something like Mr. Thirsty or Dry Shield, and um, even some uh, research on having some air purifiers in the office. So I encourage anyone to check that out, given what we're all going through. Um, on site, we have a biomaterials research laboratory, and 
this is a really interesting part of what we do. So we've got this clinical aspect where we're asking our clinicians, you know, how does this product do in your hands? Do you like the viscosity? How are the shades? I mean, it could be a range of restorative products or it could be hygiene products. Um, we also look at equipment. But another part of what we do is this, you know, third party data uh, collecting. And we do this a lot. We consult with a lot of manufacturers. They'll come to us before they even go to market with products. Um, and they'll find out, you know, how is it doing in our laboratory? How can they improve products? Uh, but a lot of what we do when it comes to adhesives and cementation, what we're talking about today, before those even go into clinicians' hands, we actually look at those in the lab and make sure that they meet a certain threshold before that, before we actually put them in a patient's mouth. So, you know, no one gets products that are going to fail. We know that they're re- they do really well. And it's a big part of what we do. And I, I think, you know, if there weren't organizations like the dental advisors and some others, and even universities, there really wouldn't be anyone helping to push the manufacturers to be better. And they're going to be better on their own. They're great. They're wonderful to work with. But, you know, we really push them to give us their best products. And, um, you know, if it's going to be a newer edition, it better be better than the the last edition. So, um, and like I said, we do pre and post market testing for manufacturers. We can do, we do I. Uh, scientific abstracts, you'll always see us at the IATR meeting um, in research reports. So for me, I practice three and a, about three days a week, and then I do dental advisor the rest of the week, and then I'm a mom and a wife. And it would be really tricky for me if I was out there, you know, maybe I'm John in Tyler, Texas, and I've got to make all these decisions about what products to use and when, because we're even in practice right now, even though the reps know that I get to look at most products on the market, I'm still getting bombarded with, you know, this is coming out. Can you look at this? What do you think? So how do you make those decisions? Um, and when you have, and how do you know that you're making the right decision? Cause we're always all striving to do the best for our patients. And I think that's what I love about the dental advisor and what we do. So people always say, you know, why do you, how do you balance both? Well, it's because I can be it make one makes me better at the other and vice versa. So if I've got a crown that's, you know, debonded or somebody I'm redoing some work and um, there's some cement in the crown, I can take it down to the biomaterials lab. They can look at it. Or if I've got an idea about something I want to look at, you know, we can do it on the fly. So I enjoy both parts of this. And I think um, all our consultants do as well. But it's important to make sure when you're looking at different products that, you know, you're going to get the internal feedback and, uh, strengths from the manufacturers, but it's also important to look at the third party uh, data that's out there. And, you know, a lot of universities are doing great uh, research on that as well as us at the dental advisor. So today we're going to talk about the ideal properties of adhesives and cements, and we'll kind of go over what universal adhesives mean. It's been around, believe it or not, for almost 10 years now, but there's still some confusion. We'll talk about the dental advisor lab data and clinical findings, and then we'll go into cements, you know, what we look for in a cement and what are good indications for use. And then as long as we have time, we'll, um, you know, kind of wrap up and do some Q&A. So let's get into universal adhesives. Those came out around 2011, 2012, and there was a lot of confusion. I'm not, I don't have time to get into the history of how we were at fifth generation, sixth, seventh, eighth, you know, and we're here at Universal. But you, I think most people understand that there were, there's been a history of changes. And when we got to Universal Adhesives, it was a lot to throw into one bottle. So, you know, prior to Universal's, I had a certain adhesive that I'd use for total etch and a certain adhesive I'd use for self etch. And now, and maybe even some other adhesives I'd use for my direct versus indirect. And now what we're, these manufacturers were saying at that time was, hey, you can use this one bottle and you can accomplish a lot of different bonding procedures. You can you have the flexibility to do whatever you know etching mode you want. You can do self-etch, selective etch, uh, total etch. And then there were some companies that said, you know what, we're also going to throw in the primers that you have to use. So we were used to now at this point, putting primers on our zirconia and our Emacs, we put silane. So now they've got that in this little bottle. Some have dual cure activators if you you want to self cure. So it's a lot in one bottle. And I'll be honest, when when they first all came out, I was pretty skeptical as well. But I would say since, you know, 2012 to 2013, I would say probably about 90% of what I use, 95% of what I use is a universal adhesive. Uh, the companies that I'm going to talk about next with some of the research, they're all companies that have done 
you know, they're feeding off of their old technology that they had, and it's still great technology. So these are companies who put a lot of money into research and we still have people who are out there saying, you know, these don't work. But I mean, I tell you, we, I mean, I, I evaluate my work. We take photos of our work. We do it at one year, two year, three year, four year, and we're not seeing that staining with some of these. So what I'm going to talk to you about next is just a couple of these different products that are out there. So basically, again, they're just designed to simplify your steps um, in indirect and direct procedures. So how do you know? You know, I mentioned that some of these are self-etched, some are selective etch, some are total etch, you know, some have primers, silane. How do you know what is in each bottle? What we try to do every year is have, um, aside from this year due to the pandemic, is have a cementation and bonding because it seems to be such a big hot topic and there's a lot of confusion around it. And so what we'll do is we've got an issue and they're generally, you know, 15 to 20 pages long, but the first five to eight pages will be about this topic and we'll always include um, some kind of table like we are here that I'm showing you where we've got company names. And then if you look, you know, it says indicated for etching modes, you know, does it require a separate dual activator? Does it prime silica based and zirconia based ceramic metal restorations? Yes, no. And so we try to give you like a little cheat sheet. And, you know, from there, you can decide what's important to you, depending on what kind of procedures you like to do. And we also give you a clinical rating. And again, these companies, this is not their first rodeo. They've done adhesives before. They're just building on old te older technology and making it better. So Carrari, I'm going to talk about Clearfill Universal Quick Bond. This is um, a universal bonding agent by Carrari. And for those of you who know, Carrari's had a great, I mean, a great reputation as far as adhesives go. They've got Clearfill SE and SE Protect, which was a sixth generation adhesive, which was a self, -etch. it's a self, it's one of the strongest self etching um, adhesives out there. And, you know, whether you ask, you know, researchers or uh, anyone from university, everyone knows that that's a great product and they've got patents on, they had have patents on MDP. So they've done some great stuff with the technology that um, goes into adhesives. And they came up with this Clearfill Universal Bond Quick, Universal Quick Bond. And basically, it was a lot more, it was a little bit different than what we were used to with the, even the universal adhesives, because now the application time changed. So you've got a three second application time. And what I'd urge you to do, no matter what adhesive you go with, and more and more people are going towards the universal adhesives, whatever you go with, make sure you read the instructions. Uh, many of them say, you know, agitate the adhesive for 10 seconds, 20 seconds, you know, really air dry gently, or, you know, do it with some, do it for 10 seconds, 20 seconds, whatever it is, just make sure you read the instructions and follow them. With this, it's kind of interesting because it's just a three second application time. And, and prior to this, we're really used to, you know, really scrubbing that adhesive on. And if I was, if I didn't have the research to back it up, I might have been even a little bit more skeptical. But since we did have the research, you know, these are companies who are, before they even go to launch, they're working with us and some, you know, universities. And what we did was we looked at it on enamel and dentin, and we compared the Clearfill Universal Bond Quick to the Scotch Bond Universal and the OptiBond Solo Plus. We did Total Etch for the OptiBond Solo Plus, and then both Self and Total Etch for the Scotch Bond Universal. So you can look at the, on the bottom, you can see application time. You've got three second, 20 second, 15 second. And when you look at these bond strength numbers, you know, with 5,000 uh, thermocycling, you can see that they're right there up there with the 20 second and the 15 second um, competitor products. So this product definitely does work in the lab and that definitely gives me confidence to try it out. Um, but if I didn't have this, it would be tricky to go, you know, we're just so set in our ways and we know that we've got a, the longer we like here, the better in some cases, and the longer we scrub, the better. But in this case, they're saying, you know what, all you need is three seconds. We can validate it with this data. And this is a research report that we give to the, um, that we do. And the company, if they want to publish it, they can publish it. And there's a lot of research that we do that doesn't get published because the companies may go back to the drawing board and um, get their numbers higher by doing a different version of it. And again, this is the research report. If you're interested in any of this, if you're interested in whether they're an adhesive or cohesive failures or mixed, you can log on to our website. Um, and then clinically, so we've got the research clinically, this did wonderful. And again, our consultants are really used to looking at different products. So they, as long as we've got the research that shows that this is 
you know, passed the test in the laboratory. Now we can move on with the clinical. This, we had 31 consultants look at it uh, for about two to three months. We had 1,065 total uses. You know, people said that it was just easy to dispense. It had a great viscosity. It was, you know, thinly coats the surface where applied, uh, quick, simple, and versatile, suitable for all bonding procedures. And these are just little, you know, short comments, but there's a whole, you know, one, two page clinical evaluation that goes into this. And if, again, if you want to read that, you can go on to even Karari's website, and I'm sure they'll have it there. So another universal bonding agent that's a little bit different than what we'd uh, be used to is the Tokiana, Tokiyama Universal Bond. And this is actually the first self-cured uh, universal bonding agent on the market. And so it's two component and it's self-cured. So it doesn't require any surface agitation, light curing, or wait time. And again, it is hard to wrap your head around not light curing something. And if I didn't have this research, I don't know if I'd be jumping on this because I think, oh my gosh, I mean, that's the last thing I want is for me to do, you know, a whole quadrant of interproximal lesions, restore them, and then have them debond because I didn't light cure. So what we did is the same, you know, the, the research that we're doing when we're working with the companies is to say, hey, let's do something that will help give the clinicians some confidence in your product and something that you can use, you know, internally. So what we did here is we looked at it um, at 24 hours and 5,000 uh, thermocycles on self-etched dentin and total etched enamel. And you can see those numbers are really high. And generally with um, adhesives, our threshold is, and I think universally too, 20 megapascals is kind of the gold standard as far as where you want your adhesives to be as far as strength. So this definitely meets it. And again, if you're interested in this research report, you know where to find it. And clinically did great as well. We had, you know, 33 consultants look at it 686 times. Great material for deeper preps and post-core buildup. And I think that's really important. You know, if you're doing a lot of, you know, depending on the type of practice and what kind of you're doing post and core buildups, but this is really nice to not have to rely on a light because we're so worried about, there's so many failures that happen. I think the light um, curing is one of the biggest issues that we have with failures in dentistry. And when you take that component out and you're just relying on a self-cure, that's pretty amazing. You, you take out that whole area of, you know, when you're talking about when things aren't cured properly, but you're not, you don't have sensitivity or micro leakage because something's not cured. So if you're relying solely on a self cure and you know it works, that should give you some confidence. And there's definitely a place for um, adhesives like this. Another one that is um, actually coming to market um, in January, I believe, first quarter, is 3M Scotch Bond Universal Plus Adhesive. And this is building on their 3M Scotch Bond. Uh, universal that they had. They were one of the first to come to the market. And again, a lot of skepticism, but this bonding agent has really shown through the years to, to work and it's reliable and it gives you a good bond. Um, it's forgiving in some areas. So it's really been a great adhesive. And this newer version, um, it's a single bottle, it range single bottle. It's BPA free. And I think in this world that we live in, it seems like more and more people want to know what's going into their mouth. And, you know, we've got a lot of BPA free composites, but this is, you know, BPA free uh, adhesive, which is a nice thing to have on hand. Um, it's also radio opaque, which is something that we all um, look for in our, you know, flowables or in our resin composites and, you know, cements, but it's nice to have it in our adhesive as well. So this is, again, just, all, I love the I love that these companies keep coming out with different things because it really the competition for us clinicians is good because we're always going to end up with even a better product and even a better product. Um, and with this adhesive, the newer one, it says that they've also had an increased bond to glass ceramics if you use it um, as a pri as a primer for the intaglio surface. So when we looked at this, basically what we wanted to do is just make sure that it you know, compared to the Scotch Bond Universal that we'd known and used many for many years, even in our laboratory, and we'd known over time worked. So if you look at the self-etch and total etch on dentin enamel, it does very well. Um, in some cases, even slightly better. 
And then this is what a clinical evaluation, like a full clinical evaluation will look like after they're done and it's gone out. This went out to almost 40 clinicians. And the, you know, there's a lot of comments about the redesigned bottle that delivers a very small amount. And maybe you don't think that's an important uh, thing to know, but it actually is. I mean, if you look at how many, I mean, how many times have we sat there and you're doing a little buckle pit or maybe a little occlusal or a little anterior uh, restoration and you've got, you look over and there's like a well of bonding agent and you're just like, wow, that was just a lot of money that just went down the drain. So having a bottle that dispenses a really small amount at a time is something that if you're looking at the bottom line, you know, overall at your clinical practice and, um, you know, the revenue and whatnot, this is one of those things that you just want to make sure you're not wasting product. And this is a good designed bottle. So really good comments. This, on this, we did speak to the universal uh, plus adhesive. If you look over to the right on the IPX Emax CAD, you can see when used as a silane or as a primer for zirconia. I mean, you're in the 60 megapascals. You really don't even need that, but it's really high and you just know it, it works. Another one that I use in clinical practice and I, I like, I really like the delivery of this is that he's Universal Viva Pen by Ivaclar. And what I like, again, when you're looking at you know, how do you get, how do you dispense these adhesives just so you're using what you have and you're not wasting a lot? Um, this is great because it's got this, all you do is you change the tips on it and it's got a little micro brush applicator on it. And that little green button that you see that's facing you is a little button you push a couple of times the adhesive gets to the micro brush and then you can use it directly. You don't need to have a separate micro brush. You're not fumbling around with a, you know, uh, adhesive well, uh, you can just put it right where you need it. So it really neat delivery. So we're gonna hop on to the ideal properties of a cement. And my main thing that I really want out of all my cements is, let's be realistic about this. We just want it to stay in place, right? We don't want any sensitivity, all this, but really at the end of the day, we want something that's gonna work. And the worst day you can have, you know, one of the worst things is you have a patient come in with their crown in your hand and something didn't go right. And now they, they're they upset. You know, they, you, you're going to lose confidence in your patients and it just doesn't make for a good day. So you really want good mechanical properties. You want high bond strength, good compressive strength. All these things are what we want in all of our cements. You also want good handling um, and cleanup properties. Because especially with these newer resin cements, not newer, I mean, now they're, you know, 10, 20 years old, but they're, they're really, they can be really translucent, they can be really thin, and they can get um, in between the teeth, and you don't see it until you take the, that bite wing and it shows up on the hygiene, and they're, you know, trying to get to it without making a big scene. But so it's really important that these cements, when you tack cure them, that they clean up really easily. And you also don't want, you know, a cement that's just so difficult to remove it. as you're trying to remove it, you know, you, your gums to get irritated. You want your field to be nice and clean and dry during cementation. So this is also really important. You also want good physical properties. Um, color stability is huge with a lot of these. We're seeing a lot more aesthetic cases. Great, you know, we've got great ceramics for aesthetics now. So you wanna make sure that the, the stability of these cements is not changing over time. You want them also to be radiopaque. Again, every, anything that can be radiopaque, the more radiopaque, the better for me. Um, and you want low film thickness so you don't have any issues with seeding. And last, and I, there's others as well, but you want things to be biocompatible, especially with the soft tissue and the teeth. And it just helps with the overall cementation and the, and the irritation. You don't want any irritation. So this is, you want it to be biocompatible. So when we look at cements, um, I'm going to start with this 3M cement and kind of go into some of the research because it's, as far as cements go, there's not a ton of innovation um, that I've seen personally. Um, there's some, I'll talk about another cement too, but we've really, what we're used to right now is we've got, you know, three categories of cements when we're talking about resin cements. We're, we've got self-adhesive cements, which you can put directly into a crown without putting anything on the tooth. So that's something like, I'll go right into this. 
something like Unisem, which is on the upper. So, you know, if you are used to using an RMGI cement, this would be something that'd be really similar. You just put it into the crown and then you can put it on the tooth. It cleans up fairly easy. Uh, don't necessarily have that many shades, sometimes, you know, two or three shades, but um, and, and on the scale of the strength, as far as the resin cements go, I see it's on the lower end. So it's simple to use, but it's also lower in strength. Then the next set, kind of next category category that we have is called an adhesive resin cement, which you can see that 3M Relax Ultimate. And basically with this system, you're actually putting an adhesive on the tooth and you're getting a higher bond strength because you're actually putting something on the tooth. So the crown is prepared and you're also, and with these universal bonding agents, you can decide if you want to total etch, etch, self etch, whatever you want to do on the tooth. Um, but generally total etch or self etch is what you're going to do. Um, and then you're going to put that cement in and what 3M did recently. So they had both of these products out in the market and they came out with a cement that basically can be used with or without an adhesive. So prior to this system in my office, I could have a self adhesive for maybe my zirconia crowns, if that's the route I wanted to go. And maybe for my glass ceramics, my Emacs and my G, you know, GC's new a glass ceramic. I could use the Relax Ultimate. Just depends on what you want to do. So I've got a couple different cements going on, and maybe for my aesthetic cases, I've got another cement uh, with more shades. But now, what this cement is saying, this new 3M cement, it's saying, you know what? You can actually use this one syringe, and you can use it with or without an adhesive. So it's very different than anything that we've looked at before. It's the syringe is also very different looking. We're all we're used to these. Uh, dual barrel syringes, which have these big tips, and we know we're wasting cement in them, but it's all that we've known for many, many years now. So we've got this new cement, and some of the things that are going through our mind um, at the dental advisor when we're working with a company like 3M, and again, this was like maybe 18 months ago that we started working. You know, they came to us from uh, Seafeld in Germany to say, "Hey, we're going to be coming out with these products." And kudos to companies, all the companies that I've talked about today, is that they're you know that they're good because they go out and they make sure that they've got their boxes checked in all these other, in these areas. And they're, you know, it's not that they come up with an idea and they go to market. I mean, it takes a year, a couple of years to actually get something going. That's a good quality product. And um, when they launch it, then they have all the data from their independent uh, evaluation, you know, companies and data laboratories, as well as their universities. So, um, what we did for this was we wanted to know, is there, the cement looks very different. Is this cement the same bond strength that my, the you know self-adhesive version of this and the adhesive version would be? Um, and also the syringe looks really different. When I look at, at it initially, I mean, it looks like a flowable syringe. Am I gonna get like five uses out of this? Like what, what am I gonna get out of this? And does it really work? So what we did with this, cement as we looked at the time it was an experimental cement and we compared it to uh, Relax Unisem 2, Maxim Elite. Um, and then we used the adhesive version and we compared it to Verilink Aesthetic DC, which is by Ivoclar, which is a great product as well. And then we looked at it on different substrates. So we looked at it on dentin, enamel, Emacs, uh, zirconia, and we used the indirect shear bond test method. And let's look at dentin first. And for me, dentin bond when it comes to cements is you know very very important it, it's an integral part of whether the longevity of this what if you have a good strong dentin bond you know you're gonna it's gonna influence the longevity of this restoration so when we look at self-adhesive let's just look at to the left you can see 3m relax universal versus uh relax unisem 2 and maximum elite even when you compare it to its unisem 2 in self-adhesive mode, you're almost getting double the bond strength. And this is on dentin, so that's huge. When you look at it compared to the very link um, aesthetic and the adhesive mode, you know, they're both about 40, both doing very well. And then when you look at zirconia, you can see that, um, again, the 3M Relax universal and self etch mode, self-adhesive mode, even when compared to its Unisem 2, is a little, you know, less than half. You know, it's almost double of what the Unisem 2 is. So this is doing really, really well. We, haven't, we don't really don't see these numbers in the laboratory. Um, and it's same for the adhesive. And 
again, this is, if you want some extra information, we've got some stuff on our website, but you can look at it, you know, compared to Emacs um, and Zirconia on here as well. So conclusions, you know, when we looked at this new cement, it was the highest of any self-adhesive cement we tested uh, with this method by Dental Advisor and the Zirconia bond strengths were also the highest. I took this quick video with my dental assistant and what I want you to pay attention to is how the, the tips are changed, you know, how much waste is created, even in just going from one application to the next. So I'm on the right and as you all know, we've got to sit there, remove whatever it is that we have on there, extrude a little bit, and then put a new tip on. And then before you can put any in the crown, you can extrude a little bit more and then you can put it in the crown. I'm actually gonna play this again so that you can focus a little bit on the one on the right now, or one on the left. So here you don't have to extrude anything because it's a self-sealing um, syringe. You extrude a little bit right before you put it on the crown, inside the crown. You're done. And so if you look at my dental assistant, what she did on the left versus what I'm doing on the right, you're saving probably about five, 10 seconds. In some other instances, maybe that doesn't make a huge difference to me, but when I'm cementing a crown, those seconds are valuable, right? Because we're trying to keep a dry working field. And the sooner I can get that crown on the tooth, the better. So we're saving time. And then even if you just look at the amount of waste just from the extrusion. So the reason I'm showing this in such great detail is that this is a really innovative syringe. You know, we need to start pushing for, for other companies to um, do things that are gonna be easier on us so we're not wasting so much material. And also I'll talk a little bit about the waste too. So one of the things about this um, syringe, like I mentioned earlier was, does it actually give me as much material as my other syringes do? And so what we did was we looked at the top one is their new syringe. And we looked at the Verilink Aesthetic, both in a five gram and a nine gram. We looked at the Ultimate, um, Densply, and a Kerr product. And what we found, what we wanted to see is out of those syringes, how many applications we got. So the blue um, bar shows you the number of applications for like a 90 microliters. And that basically will give you enough to fill a crown. So with the top, new cement, you can actually get 15 full coverage crowns. And if you were gonna do veneers or smaller, maybe mandibular crowns, you would get 20 uses. So that's a lot. And when you look at that, it's pretty crazy that a 3.4 gram syringe can get that many uses, pretty similar to even those larger 8.5, nine um, gram syringes. Cause those, if you look at Verilink and Relax Ultimate, they're getting about 16, 17. So this is right there up, up there with that. So that's pretty remarkable from that small, syringe. So what we also looked at was how much of the cement was wasted versus usable. And when we looked at the Relax Universal, we're still getting all those applications. And when we, we there's a whole testing mechanism that goes into place where you're measuring, you know, the waste and the tips. And we actually found that you're getting about close to 70% of that cement that's in that new syringe you can actually use and you waste about 30% of it. So now I want you to kind of think about in your head what you think those numbers are gonna be for the for the traditional um, dual barrel syringes. Because I know prior to this, it's just like you're watching that cement extrude through that tip and you know that you're wasting a lot of it. I probably would have guessed maybe about 50%, but after we did the study, it, it turns out that we're actually wasting about 70% of the cement in those automix syringes. So between the tips and the extruding, you're actually, you're only using 30%. So every time you're spending all that money on those syringes, I want you to look at it and be like, oh my goodness. So there's other options, you know, for smaller tips um, that you can get. We've got some research on that too, but just be conscientious of the fact that you're only, you're paying for a lot of waste. And then when we look at the actual plastic waste, um, Overall, if you're trying to kind of lessen the your footprint in this world, it is nice. You know, when you we we use so much plastic, and it's great because we got single use, and we're not we're conscientious about infection control. But we do, as a profession, we generate a lot of waste. So this is nice to know that we've got less plastic waste. And then here are some conclusions um, that I just already discussed with you as far as the waste. One other last thing I'll kind of point out on this. 
is, and again, the reason that I'm really stressing this is because these are things that we need to, as a professional, push for these manufacturers to get better at doing, because this is really innovative design. But this, at the end of it, if you notice when you, there's no tip on it. So right now, if I place a crown, then my assistant will put a new tip on it or put the old, not the old tip, but the tip that seals it back on. This actually has a self-sealing tip. And basically you can push on it. Not, no syringe will come out, but you can see there's some valves in there that get completely sealed off. And the way that you can actually cement or anything and get it to dispense is you actually click it in and turn it left and then it dispenses. And you can just kind of see the internal structure of this because, and that's the whole reason why you don't have to extrude a little bit after you, uh, right before you put on the syringe tip is the self-sealing mechanism. So it is easy to use, did very, very well in our, um, amongst all of our clinicians. Uh, again, great, great cement. The other cement that I want to talk about is um, Panavia SA, and this is a Karari cement. And this is uh, Panavia SA Cement Universal. And again, I'm just trying to point out some different innovations today. Uh, I can usually I can do a cement adhesive lecture in half day or a full day, you know, preferably in public. But this is great too. I enjoy sharing the screen with everybody tonight. But um, I really want to just focus on some of these things that you're seeing that might seem a little bit you know, where, where is this coming from? Does this, is this backed by research? A lot of this is backed and a lot of these products are great, especially the ones I mentioned today. Um, but this is Panavia SA Universal. Um, and with this, it's saying there's no need for a separate primer or silane um, because, and so that's important with like Emacs. Before with these self-adhesive cements, you could put them on zirconia and still get a good bond. There's, you know, some type of MDP mono, monomer, most of these self-adhesive cements. And you could not have to put a zirconia primer and still get a good bond. So, but you didn't see that with the glass ceramics. So, uh, this new Panavia SA Cement Universal came out with uh, the cement that is actually saying you can use it for glass ceramics as well. So your Emacs and your, you know, uh, other whatever glass ceramics that you're using. So we looked at this um, with the Panavia SA Cement. If you look on the left, the sheer bond strength to ceramics. We looked at Panavia SA with Emacs and uh, Zirconia, and you can see the bond to the actual ceramics and the glass ceramics. And Zirconia was almost 60 megapascals, again, very high. You look at something like Relix Looting Plus, which is not in the same category as this because it's a RMGI, but just to kind of show you comparison um, of the bond strengths that you're getting with that versus a Unisem 2 when you actually use Unisem 2 with a ceramic primer you're getting those um, higher numbers. So definitely innovative. It does work. And when you look at um, the bond, snake, bond string to the left or to the right as well. Another, so we talked about two kind of subsets of cements. One was a self-adhesive. The other was an adhesive resin cement where you're applying something. And then the new uh, version of 3Ms where you get a combination of both. And then there's another type of uh, uh, cement that I really like to use and to have in my toolbox is something that I can use in aesthetic cases. And Ivoclar Vivident has definitely, you know, even prior to this, had um, very link veneer and very link veneer too, but they've done a great job of, uh, you know, they do a great job of ceramics. We've got our Emacs, our Empress, and their new Zirconia, but they've also done a great job with shades when it comes to their aesthetic uh, cement. So I really like this because there's a dual cure version of it and there's a light cured version. Um, and it also comes with try and paste. So you can just, if you've got a really thin restoration and you just want to try it in before you pick the final uh, cement shade, you can see here that there's five um, cements shades and it comes in a light plus, light, neutral, warm, and a warm plus. And their shade um, are based on value, which is Great. So you can decide where you kind of need to be with value. And then there, again, there's the try and uh, shades, which coincide with the shades. So if you want to try it in, you can do that. Just a really nice, easy to use cement. So any of my um, aesthetic cases, I'll definitely be using this. In the pictures prior, I showed it with a rubber dam, but now I use an optergate for 
um, all my, most of my cementation, most of my preps, if you haven't tried this, you know, this is a great product for scanning, uh, but it's just definitely made my life as far as it's just a lot more comfortable for the patients. I feel like I use these aftergates in a lot of different indications, but this is definitely seating procedure. Cementation is a great one. So what I wanted to show you with this uh, very link aesthetic was that uh, at the dental visor, we do clinical evals, we do research, but we also follow some things in the long term. And this is just to show you that, you know, this was, it's not a newer report. It's been out for a while now, but even at that point at 18 months, you know, there wasn't any debonds. We looked at aesthetics, we looked at sensitivity, mar marginal leakage, and it got a 99%. And we're talking 216 restorations that were retroactively, you know, they were placed and we, we did a chart review. And so this does well, it doesn't change color over time. If you're looking for a good aesthetic cement, this is definitely one I would highly recommend. And then this is, you know, we're kind of kind of wrap up things again. This is a pretty quick summary for just an hour long webinar. But when you're trying to figure out what the best cement is, you really, there's a couple of things that I always look at for me. And this is one of the charts. This is one of the little uh, infographs I put together for our cementation and bonding issue uh, last year. But it's, you know, you want to look at retention for sure. So, and be honest with yourself. You know, no one really cares, but, you know, but you, your patient cares, but be honest, don't think that you've got this great pet. If it's not retentive, then don't put something that's got a lower um, strength cement, you know, use something with a higher strength of cement where you've got to put an adhesive on the tooth. Um, and also just look at the strength of your ceramic too. So something that is good to know that if you've got a high, high strength ceramic, like zirconia, and you've got retention with a high strength ceramic, it's okay to use a low strength um, adhesive. But not in, in, but when you have a low strength ceramic like a feldspathic, um, you want to make sure that you have a high strength adhesive. So there is that uh, inver inverse proportion there. But really, just be honest with yourself. Whenever if I'm in a case like you know I do mostly zirconia and Emacs, and if I've got a zirconia and I'm on a second molar, and if I don't have retention, if I didn't do any grooves, I am not going to use a resin modified glass ion or a self adhesive. I'll definitely go to an adhesive resin, you know, with zirconia. I'll do everything that I need to, because that's usually the biggest question I get during lectures is, you know, I'm having an issue with zirconia uh, crowns uh, popping off. What do I do? You know, if you have some availability within the tooth structure and you're not going to compromise the tooth to put some retention grooves in, you can do that. Or, you know, for, as far as my cementation protocol for all zirconia, you know, I try it in. I try in the crown and then I clean, clean it with something like IvaClean or ZirClean by Bisco clean that out. And then I put a primer in a zirconia, you know, a dedicated zirconia primer or something like Monobond plus, which incorporates all of it. And then I put the cement in and I, again, I'm going to use something like an adhesive resin cement versus uh, the self adhesive. But if I've got a really retentive zirconia all day long, I'll put something with a lower strength, you know, and I'm not opposed to RMGIs or self adhesives. Uh, but like I said, if it's not retentive, you're going to have to do everything in your power to make sure you're doing all the right things to get the highest strength. So that about wraps it up for us. Um, you know, we've got a great team in Ann Arbor. We've got um, a lot of people that answer questions as they come up. So if there's anything that you want you know, an explanation for or anything that you want us to elaborate on, you know, you can always just email us at connect at dentaladvisor.com and somebody will get back to you. And here are my, here's my information. I've got an Instagram and LinkedIn, Facebook, and my uh, office email if you have any questions for me. Um, and I guess one of the questions that I do get a lot before I even end this, because we're going to see if we have time to do any Q&A, but one of the questions I always get asked is, you know, is there a cement that you recommend for um, implant grounds? And so I would say, for me personally, I try to do most of my implant crowns screw retained. And if I can do that, that's great. And that's maybe 90% of the time. And then the others, I will do a cement. I'll have to use, a, you know, cement and a custom abutment. But generally what I really like is um, something that's going to be very, again, biocompatible with this, the tissues. So 
I fear that sometimes those resin cements are so thin or so clear that I won't be able to see them. And, and we just don't want those issues with the implant crowns where there's cement um, left in place. So I'll generally use something like an RMGI. GC has a great um, RMGI. And then also uh, Ceramere by, was by Doxa. But they have a great, great cement that is easy to clean up, is very uh, kind to the tissues. And um, yeah, so that's about it. Let me think and see if there's any, if Adam has anything else for me. If not, if he thinks I have enough time for questions, we'll come back. Um, but if not, um, it's been great. Like I said, if you have any questions, call us. Um, don't call us, but you can email us. Email us, we'll get back to you. And um, it's been a pleasure tonight. So thank you, Henry Shine. Uh, thank you for giving us this platform to share information. Have a good night. Thank you, Dr. Bunnick, for the presentation. We do have time for a couple questions. The first one is, with the availability of universal bonding agents, are there clinical situations where the use of phosphoric acid etching would be indicated? You know, so I use that. It's kind of your own personal preference about what you want to do. Um, and again, I would base that a little bit on retention as well. You know, how much retention do you have? If I'm on a second molar and I'm really just trying to get a good bond um, and I'm using zirconia or, you know, I will on the tooth, not inside the crown because you don't want to do that with zirconia, but I mean, I'll do anything extra. And if I can get your, it's, I can always get a little bit extra bond strength by using a total etch system on dentin. Um, and I'll do that in those situations. But I think it's just kind of a case by case and how you practice it. I think the beauty of these um, universal adhesives are you can still practice the way that you're practicing, but now you just have limited inventory. You don't need to stock a self-adhesive and a total etch and something with uh, that's going to give you uh, that you can use for your post and cores with a dual cure activator. I mean, you really can just combine everything and you could still, you don't have to change the way you practice. You're just limiting the amount of inventory that you have. And it just makes it easier on your assistants and your team. And just overall, you know, with your, what you're ordering, it's like, we know we need this bonding agent because we use it for, and not only are we just using it, I mean, we can use it for indirect situations and direct situations. I mean, it really, before we had to have totally different systems for indirect and, and direct. So I think um, as far as the phosphoric acid etching, I would just continue to do however you, you know, have bonded things in the past. But for me, I usually base it on if I feel like I need a little bit more bond strength uh, due to retention or and whatnot. So that's that. What amount of bond strength to dentin would you consider to be minimum for a bonding agent or adhesive cement? 10 MPA, 20 MPA, or something else? Okay, so we talked about this a little bit with adhesives. Um, in the lab, generally with um, any kind of adhesive that we're gonna put on the tooth, you know, 20 megapascals is generally the gold standard, the th threshold where we wanna be. Um, and when it comes to cements, we're gonna see that, you know, the RMGIs, even in that slide that I showed, earlier. Um, let me see if I can, sorry, I'm going to take you back here, but with the RMGIs and the uh, self-adhesive resin cement. So with the RMGIs, I mean, you're getting, sometimes you can get somewhere from like five to seven megapascals. So very low, but they have a different, um, it's, it's a totally different reaction um, that's happening as far as the chemistry goes. And those resin modified glass ionomers are very low um, in strength, but you, again, like I said before, if you've got something retentive, you can use those with high strength ceramics. So something even with like zirconia or with PF, PFMs, that's what was traditionally used. Um, Self-adhesives, we would see things in the range, you know, right about 10 would be good. Um, now we're seeing things up in the range of, you know, 14, 15, and uh, even the new cements that I uh, showed you today are even higher. So. I would say at least about 20 for um, your adhesives you want to look for and uh, somewhere between 10 and 15 for your self uh, adhesive cements. And you're going to get any, you're going to get a lot higher when you're looking at your adhesive resins anytime that you're adding an adhesive to the tooth. Great. Thank you. Uh, let's see. What are the indications for a glass ionomer or resin modified glass ionomer luring cement? 
alluding to but yeah so like I said for my I have a lot of uh when I lecture, there's a lot of um, clinicians in the audience that still use, they love using the RMGI. And there's a beautiful thing about using an RMGI cement because it cleans up so well. You don't, you know, the environment can be a little bit more moist. It doesn't have to be as dry as um, it's not as technique sensitive. So these are great cements. And I think if you're, again, if you're using it with like a higher strength metal or, you know, zirconia, I think they're great. I know people that use them with Emacs and they have great success. It just depends on what you want to do. But I'd say the majority of people are still just using those for the zirconia. Um, it's just when you have good retention. A lot of questions about the RMGIs. That's good. With the availability of universal resin cements, are there clinical situations where you would want to use a bonding agent and or a ceramic primer? Okay. So that's, uh, I think, the question is more about, okay, so I've got this, uh, you know, I've got this universal cement, I've got this universal bonding agent, and this bonding agent can now be used on the tooth. And it's also saying that I can use it on the internal surface of the crown. That's how I'm interpreting this question. So do I, I think in normal practice, I'll be honest, I don't necessarily use my adhesive in both indications. I have a separate primer that I use. So, you know, something like Again, Monobond Plus by Ivoclar, which has silane in it, and it has uh, something for zirconia. Um, you can use it on metals. That, for me, is something that my assistant can do um, on the side. And, you know, it's not interfering with my bonding. And also, I think we just have to be realistic about it. Look at what you're purchasing. Look at the price. I mean, what's the price per drop? Um you know, maybe the manufacturers want you to use their adhesives, but if it's, you know, going to be more cost effective for you to get a separate primer, then I would suggest you doing that. Um, I do like the viscosity, I guess, of some of the separate ceramic primers or, you know, I've got zirconium. I mean, obviously in my office, I have a little bit of everything, but I like the specific primers. I just find that the viscosity is um, a little bit better for putting it on the internal surface. But I know people who use, I mean, that's the whole point of these is that you can use, even if you look at that um, last, uh, even the cement, I mean, now you've got these silane incorporated into a cement. There's a, you know, so you don't have to put a primer on. So that we're headed that direction. Um, but I would say if I were a clinician right now saying, hey, should I use this as, you know, in the crown and on the tooth, I would probably look at it more from like a cost perspective to say, hey, you know, this is what this bottle costs me. And this is what this costs me. I get X amount of uses out of this versus this. That's how I would look at it. Great. Thank you. Well, that'll be a wrap for us this evening. So I'd like to thank you, Dr. Bunnick, for your presentation and answers. And of course, thank you to everyone for attending tonight. Please feel free to email us at webinars at henryshine.com if you have any questions pertaining to tonight's webinar, or certainly feel free to give Dr. Bunnick a follow on social media or reach out to her directly at the email shown on screen. On behalf of Henry Shine, I wanna thank everyone again for attending. Hope everyone stays safe and have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you.